An accurate measurement of the track current would be a useful feature for any command station. And since the DCCX command interface provides a function for current reporting, I thought it would be no big deal to add an amp meter to the Red Hat Shield web page and update it, say, every half a second or so. Well, let's say I was completely wrong about that. Welcome to the IOTT channel, I am Hans Tanner. According to the DCCX command reference, all we need to do to get the actual track current is sending a C command. DCCX will then send a response with the actual current on the main track along with the trip values for the overload protection. To test it, I added a short code sequence that sends the command to DCCX every half a second and then displays the response in the Arduino monitor window. For my tests I am using two locomotives. One is equipped with an older Digitrax DH84 decoder. The other is a G-scale shunter with a Massot decoder with activated speed control. I run them at two different speed levels, first at 5% and then at 50% of the maximum speed. And as an additional reference, I also measured the current of an ohmic load of about 30 ohms. In the monitor window, we can see the messages coming from the DCCX command station after sending the C command. The A message following the C response is an obsolete message that, according to the note in the source code, will be removed in future versions of DCCX. The C response itself is exactly as documented in the reference document and we get a refresh every 500 milliseconds. If nothing is connected, it obviously shows zero. When I connect the Digitrax DH84, the resulting current remains zero, so it does not detect the decoder as long as the motor is not on. Now accelerating to speed step 5. Interestingly, the current remains mainly at zero, but about 1 out of 10 times it returns a high value of up to around 600. Turning the speed up to 50%, the high values go up to about 750, and the number of lines with high values increases to about half of all lines. The other half of the lines still shows zero. When connecting the Massot decoder instead, I get a value of 2 on every line even when the motor is turned off. Turning up to 5% and the value for the current is between 5 and about 200. Going to 50% the values goes up, but I still get changing values this time from about 20 up to 250. Finally I connected the ohmic resistor to the track. In this case I get a much more stable value of about 435 floating only between 430 and 440. That is pretty stable and I would be very happy if I would see a similar stability of the value when measuring locomotive currents. But unfortunately the measurements so far suggest that the DCCX current reporting message really cannot be used as some sort of track amp meter, particularly not for relatively low currents resulting from low speed settings of locomotives. But why? When asking about current measurement in the DCCX Discord group, I got this answer from one of the developers. We don't have a good working current monitor. Yeah, right. It looks like the current measurement of DCCX is only good for short circuit detection, but does not provide even remotely accurate current measurement, which I think is something many model railroaders would like to have. So it is time to think about better ways, but for that we first need to understand why the actual method is not working. So let's first understand how DCCX is measuring current, and then have a look at what we are actually trying to measure. The first question can be answered by digging a little bit into the source code of DCCX. Here it is. The main loop calls DCC loop, which calls the DCC waveform loop function. This loop function calls the check 
power overload function for each track. Inside the check power overload function we find a time variable that lets the function immediately return if it is not time for the next measurement. If it is time, however, the function calls the getDrawCurrent function of the motor driver, which then finally calls the analog read function to measure the analog voltage which is proportional to the current. If track power is on and the previous current measurement was within limit, the timer for sampling is set to 100 milliseconds as defined in the motor driver header file. So the track current is sampled 10 times per second and that is the data that is reported in the messages we have seen in the monitor. But what does this value actually stand for? Well, for that we need to have a look at the schematics of the motor shield. Here we see that the current of the H-bridges is conducted to ground via a 0.15 ohm resistor, from which the measured sensor signals SNSA and SNSB are taken. So when we do an analog read, we are measuring the momentary voltage on that 0.15 ohm resistor, which then is multiplied by a factor to convert it to milliamps. The readout always is the last value, there is no averaging or filtering of any kind, which explains why we get relatively stable values on an ohmic resistor and a significant fluctuation of values when measuring the motor current of a locomotive. But to understand that part better, we need to look at the current flow in more detail. To do that, I hook up the oscilloscope to two signals of the Arduino that runs DCCX. Channel 1 is connected to pin A0, which is the current sensor analog input of the track output from the motor shield. Channel 2 is connected to the DCC signal that drives the track. This first shot shows how the signals look when the ohmic load is connected. In red we see the DCC signal, which is a square wave of about 52 microseconds per half bit when sending 1 bits, and about twice that long for 0 bits. So what we see is a sequence of 5 1 bits as it is the case during the preamble of a DCC packet. The blue line shows the current consumption of the ohmic resistor. We see that it is constant while the bit is either high or low and is briefly disrupted when the polarity of the bit changes. So when we measure the current using the analog read function, we sample the signal at a random point, but because of the signal shape, we most likely will measure a spot where the signal is high. Therefore, we get relatively stable results with little fluctuation of the value. And that is simply because of the much higher probability to hit a flat area of the signal when measuring compared to kind of falling in the valley between two half bits. Now let's connect the DH84 decoder and see what signal we measure in that case. As before I first set the locomotive speed to 5% and this is what we get. Note that I changed the time base to 200 microseconds per division so that a longer sequence of the signal becomes visible. The DCC signal in red again shows a sequence of 1 bits followed by 3 0 bits and then a 1 bit again. The first part is the preamble, then comes the start bit and the first bits of the first data byte. The analog signal shows the motor current and that is quite interesting. We now have a pulse of a total length of about 1.6 milliseconds. This is one single PWM pulse from the decoder to the motor. When the pulse is switched on, the current starts to flow and gets stronger over time, because it first has to overcome the inductive resistance of the motor. After about 0.6 milliseconds it is close to the maximum value. Note that also here we get short disruption spikes whenever the polarity of the DCC signal is changing. If we zoom out even more to 5 milliseconds per division, we see that the pulse is repeated about every 16 milliseconds. This is the 60 Hz frequency of the PWM pulse the motor is driven with from the decoder. 
And by the way, this explains the very audible humming of the motor at low speed steps when using an older decoder with relatively low PWM frequency. Next, I zoom out to 10 milliseconds per division and it becomes clear why the DCC-X current measurement is not terribly successful. As we saw before, DCC-X is sampling the current with an interval of 100 milliseconds. So for example here, and then 100 milliseconds later, the next time, and it becomes immediately clear why the measurement is hit and miss. If we hit the peak, we get an unreasonably high value, because of course, during the peaks the full voltage is applied to the motor. And if we measure when the pulse is off, we get zero. Based on the shape of the signal, we could expect about 90% zeros and 10% high values. And if you check again what we saw in the monitor, that's pretty much what we got. If we now increase the speed steps to 50%, the peaks become longer and therefore the probability of finding a non-zero value increases. Looking at the waveform, it is quite obvious why now we get high values in about half of the readouts and zeros in the other half. Of course, the real current amount is somewhere in between, but with the 100 millisecond sampling rate, we cannot really tell what it is. Now, let's have a look at the method decoder, which performed slightly better in the original test. Turning it up to 5%, we see a completely different picture compared to the DH84. Yes, we still see PWM pulses, but they are more frequent than before. In fact, they start every about 62 microseconds, which results in a PWM frequency of 16 kHz. High PWM frequency is a feature of modern decoders to suppress the humming noise at low speeds. They are typically marketed under names like supersonic, silent running or quiet drive, depending on the manufacturer. The other thing that jumps out is that the signal stops after a while. When zooming out to 10 milliseconds per division, we see that there is a periodic break in the signal about every 10 milliseconds, which lasts for about 2 milliseconds. This is the time window the decoder needs to determine the current speed of the motor by measuring the back EMF. When we apply the current measurement intervals of DCCX, we see that the measurement is still random, but due to the density of the signal, we have a much higher chance to actually hit one of the spikes and get a non-zero current reading. And if we go back to our initial tests, we got a reading in most of the lines, with values fluctuating between 20 and 200, which corresponds to what, we ca what can be expected when sampling this signal. Now that we know how the current signals look like, it is clear why DCCX is not really suitable for measuring currents, at least not at low throttle settings. The way DCCX performs the measurements is good enough to detect a short circuit, which basically is a low ohmic resistance, but as soon as we try to measure the current of a PWM signal, the current sampling method is not capable of providing meaningful data, as catching that short current spike that only appears every few milliseconds is somewhat like looking for a needle in a haystack. That's really bad news for my amp meter display on the Red Hat Shield webpage. But of course, I am not ready to give up. And in fact, there are two possible approaches to solve the problem. The first one is to make the current spikes wider so that it becomes easier for the sampling software to see them. This can be done by adding a low pass filter in the form of a capacitor as for example suggested by user Ash++ in the DCCX Discord group. As a result, the short but intense spike charges a capacitor, which then keeps the load for a few milliseconds, thereby increasing the chances that the next sampling detects it. <laughs> 
Here is how the same 5% pulse of the DH84 decoder looks like if I add a capacitor to the analog input of the Arduino. And next to it are the measured current values I get in the monitor window. The values of the capacitor and resistor determine the remaining ripple in the signal and therefore the amount of fluctuation in the values I see in the monitor window. Also, the higher the value of the capacitor, the slower is the reaction time until I see increases or decreases of the current. So it is a trade-off between smooth results and fast reaction time. If I make it too slow, there might be too much of a delay for short circuit detection and also the programming function may no longer work as it needs to be able to see a short current pulse of only about 5 to 7 milliseconds. The second approach is to increase the sampling rate, in other words the frequency of the measurements, so that we can reliably catch even very short current pulses and calculate the resulting average current. What sampling rate is needed and what precision is achievable, I will analyze in one of the next videos and if you are interested in this technical stuff and don't want to miss any new videos, make sure you subscribe to the IOTT channel and hit the bell icon to stay in the loop. And that's it for this video. I hope this information was useful or at least interesting for you and you learned something about the challenges that come with doing an accurate measurement of the current on a DCC layout. If so, please click the like button below to let me know. Doing so helps to promote this video and the IOTT channel in general as YouTube likes the likes. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.